uh, how that letter was was read, what it said was was verbatim, exactly as it was ri written. And church service was, was uh, they were um, reading these letters. And so you would you would sit down. The church would sit down, you know, and the the leader, the, the head teacher, would read directly from the letter, read the letter directly, and then give commentary or you know give insight to the letter that was that was read, that was um, read in their hearing. And now today we have a lot of sermons, a lot of sermons. A lot is different when you're preaching sermons when you when you're um, grabbing a text. Amen. And then you go from that text and you go to another text and approve text and drop and jump around, you know, when you preach sermons where they are driven toward an, an idea or a doctrine, a particular thing, which is OK. But that's not the majority of how the preaching was done back then. Amen. Amen. These are heralders of the, the letters that were written. OK, so last time we finished in. Um, um, Ephesians chapter 2, we're wrapping up chapter, wrapped up chapter 2, when Paul talked about the church and everything, he talked about the loss, the love, and the working, the getting closer and, and becoming more confident in the things of God, amen, and um, this chapter, chapter 3, is, is, pretty, is, is pretty direct as it talks about the revelation or the revealing of the church and the relationship to the Gentiles the revealing of the church and the relationship to the Gentiles. Paul is moving from this, this um, chapter in chapter two where, where he is talking about what, what happened in them personally, what was going in them personally, what Christ was doing in them and how we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus and how Christ did that. And, 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 and now Paul is, He's going to transition into, into telling the Gentile church how they are a mystery revealed unto the whole world. And then he's going to make a great appeal. I believe Paul is making this appeal out of his love for the Hebrews. Right. He says that my prayer for Israel is that they might be saved. He said, I wish even if I can be a castaway and God could save Israel. That's love right there. That, that's, that's, all, that's all kind of love. And, and Paul is, is, is declaring his, his love for Israel. And I believe as he's talking to the, to the Gentile world and the Gentile church that um, Paul has in the back of his mind the persecution that's going on to, towards Israel. The persecution that Israel is under. And he's way away in Rome. And thousands and thousands of miles away is the, is the persecuted church which he was a part of. It's the person, and, and, and I believe that Paul has in his mind that, that if Israel is going to be saved, that somehow that, that the Gentile church is going, to, is going to have to step in and rescue Israel and save her from this persecution because she's been driven out of the land and out of, out of the region and, 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 and she's under great duress. And, and so I believe Paul has this in his mind as he's pleading to the Gentile world to unite with, with the Hebrew church and become one and, and be strong as one, realizing that God has called us as one. It, it, it feels the, the, the tone of this letter um, in, in the center portion of it here, chapter, chapter three, you, you almost feel like, I, as I read it, it feels like Paul's heart rate begins to pick up as he's writing, as he, like he begins to get more impassioned and enthroned in what he's saying and, and to the point that he just begins to break down while he's writing and, and starts praying, you know, and I believe that he actually dropped to his knees as he was writing and overwhelmed with emotion behind what's going on in the, in the, in the church and the persecution of the church and, and, and crying out for the Gentile church to reach out to the persecuted church and, the, and, the, and the help them be delivered and remove them from this great hour of tribulation. And that they will remain faithful. And it's amazing that that same type of commentary is what Jesus said about them as he spoke about them in Revelation. 
And, but they begin to break down and get weak in the middle of that or toward the end of, end of that more, more, more precisely. And they begin to open themselves up to special revelations and allow people to minister in their pulpits who were not qualified. And, and sometimes after long periods of war and trials and tribulation, you could just want to hear something that's, that's relief, you know, just like, man, I, I just need something. And, and, and we have to fight against that temptation to want that word because you better believe that Satan has somebody on standby with a hot word ready for you just to give you an emotional rush. And, and, and they're false apostles and, and, and they're, they're false teachers and they'll come in and they'll try to lift your spirit with something that's so um, edifying and encouraging to your soul, but God ain't in it. And we, we have to be willing to love God in the life we have and not the one we wish we had. You know, and thank God for the times we're living in and thank God for what he's given us today, you know, and, and not succumb. It's, it's a big, it's a, it's a challenge, a huge challenge not to succumb to um, wanting a break. Wanting relief, you know, wanting just like, man, God, when is it going to be my turn? When am I going to be over this? When, a, you know, is it going to happen for me? But being content and say, whether or not it ever happens for me, if my number never get called, if my ship never comes in, God, with you, I'm all right. Amen. See, sometimes that's a very tough decision to make. and It's a very tough way to be saved, to, to be content and, and find yourself in any stage, any condition, any situation to be content Amen. with what God has given you Amen. and not looking at somebody else's and say, God, why can't I have that? Right. God, why can't you do that for me? Right. You know, but, but just being satisfied, just being content right where you are. God, any way you bless me, I'll be satisfied. I, I, I'm willing to just take this right here, God. Uh, there are worse things in the world than, than, than dying without a 401k. Yes, you know, there are worse things that can happen than, than never owning a brand new car off the parking lot. There are worse things that can happen than never being a homeowner, you know. But these are the type of things that, that can get you down when, when it seems like other people are moving ahead and they, you know, they got good things going on. They seem so happy because they come to church so fake, you know, and, and they really just got finished, you know, fighting 30 seconds ago. But they turn their corner. They, hi, praise the Lord, you know. And you're like, oh, why can't I be happy like them? And God, make my marriage like theirs. And you go home, y'all getting the biggest fight of your life because you got the same fight they just got into because you, okay. <laughs> Well, 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 Paul, he, he is, he, there's almost a, a, a picking up of the pace in chapter 3 um, with his relationship and what's going on to the church of Ephesus. So, um, verse th chapter 3, verse 1 begins by reading, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. Paul said that I'm a prisoner of for the Gentiles. He said, the reason why I'm in prison is so that God can open up the gospel to the Gentiles. It's a great way to see things. Paul said that, that I'm here in the middle of the Gentile world and I'm a prisoner in this Roman prison because I can afford to get to Rome by myself to the heart of the Gentile world. So God got me arrested and got me on government trip and got me on government status and on government pay, amen, got me to the Gentile world to preach the gospel in Rome. Amen. Some of us are, oh, God won't do this, well, God won't do this, well, you don't know what God going to do. Right. You know, God will put you in situations that you never thought you would be in. All right, but he'll sustain you yeah. in the midst of it. Hallelujah. So Paul, he says, I'm a Gentile so that I may have opportunity to minister into the Gentile world. He knew he was an apostle. He knew who he was called to, and, and he allowed himself to be, to, to, to be put in this prison. He, it was, if you read the, how it happened, that, you know, that he may be put in this prison so that he, have, he would have access to preach. Hallelujah. He says... If you, if you had heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to me, given me towards you, how that by revelation he made known unto me 
the mystery. Say the mystery. The mystery. Amen. Now, this is a great mystery. And some believe that he's referring to the book of Daniel and the, the, the um, 70 week of Daniel's and, and Daniel. And then in the, uh, in the 63rd week, the, the Messiah was cut off. You know, then after the Messiah was, was cut off, there's a, there's a gap, there's a great space and period of time. And then, um, uh, then it picks right back up with the Antichrist on the scene. Well, um, um, no, the, 49, the 49 weeks of Daniel and the 42nd week, and then that's when they believe that, you know, uh, the church age is that gap in between. And, and the, the Hebrew world, the rabbis and everyone, they didn't really understand what that gap was all about, which, which a lot of scholars believe this is referring to the church age or the dispensation of grace, where God was no longer um, dealing with the Hebrews as um, his only people, but God has a period in time where he's dealing with all people under, the, under this dispensation called grace. So um, th they're hearing about the gospel that's coming, and Paul is saying, yeah, I am representation of this dispensation of grace unto all people that God is not just dealing with Hebrews, he's dealing with all people from all over the world. Right. He's dealing with the Jews and the Gentiles. So he's saying that, um, God revealed this to him by revelation. Uh, he made known unto me the mystery as, as I wrote afore in a few words. Whereby, when you read, you may understand my knowledge and the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not what? It was my name no, made known. That in other ages, um, Christ being crucified was not a reality that the Hebrews understood, even though it's in prophecy that the Messiah shall come and then he shall be cut off. Well, that cutting off didn't make sense because the Hebrews, the Hebrews were believing that when the Messiah came, he would immediately set up his kingdom and they would rule the world from Israel. But, but the, the Messiah was cut off. And when, when the Messiah was cut off, um, there was a gap. And the, in that gap is what's called the church age. And there will be a time, as in the book of Revelation talks about, where God deals with the 12 tribes of Israel. And he deals with the world through them. Yet still there, there is grace. Amen. That's saying, but that's dealing with the book of Revelation. But this is a mystery, okay? So he says, how that by revelation made known unto me uh, the mystery, as I wrote unto you before in a few words, um, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto who? His holy, His holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So this is a revelation that um, comes from the text, but you didn't get it just by knowing the text. You had to get this by knowing the God of the text. And and this, this revelation that God was not only dealing with the Jews, but now dealing with the Gentile world, was huge into the Gentile world because the Gentile world knew and understood that the Hebrews believed that God was only dealing with them, that the Hebrew God was an exclusive God working exclusively through the Hebrews, and the Gentile world knew this. This wasn't their first interaction with one another. They didn't just find out about one another. They understood their religion and how it worked. And Paul said, I'm showing you something that even the, the prophets of old did not clearly understand and see. But now he has revealed it to the, uh, the modern day apostles back then. Um, the, those modern day apostles, how that God was now reaching out to everyone by Christ Jesus. That you didn't have to be Hebrew to have a relationship with God. Yeah. And that this great, powerful, almighty God, creator of the universe, who revealed himself through prophecy, amen, made himself known through the, the, the people, that this, not, that this one great and mighty God is now making a relationship for everyone. You, this is good news to the, to the Gentiles. Amen. Because some believed and, and some um, wanted to believe, but it was such a, a, a prejudiced religion that others didn't seek to come in just so happily. Because they would tell you, you're going, you're, 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 you're other, you're, you're, you're Gentiles. You know, you're not a part of this. 
but I will give you my morals, my values, my virtues, you know, and all these things to help make the world a better place. But you can't really, you know, be one of us. But you, you can, you know, you can act like us and God will like you. But you won't be on our status. And so Paul is saying God has erased that status and made himself open to all men everywhere. This is great news for the Gentile world. So he says um, in other ages it was not made known unto the sons of men as it is now revealed by his holy. Somebody say holy. Because you got some apostles and prophets and, and, and they, they okay. But by his um, holy apostles and prophets by the spirit that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs in of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ. How? By the gospel. So the, the, the good news that Christ did just didn't die for the, for the um, Hebrew world, but he died for the church. He died for all people, regardless of our ethnicity, our background, our race. The blood of Jesus is for everybody. Amen. You cannot be excluded from the blood. Amen. The sacrifice of Christ is sufficient to save anybody from their sin. It alone is enough. You don't need any other traditions. You don't need any other ways. You don't need any other stories or backgrounds or any other traditions. What you need is this book. And you get this book and reveal to you the Messiah. So that the Gentiles will be fellow heirs. Their fellow heirs are one. That there is no difference. That God doesn't see the Jews and Gentiles any different. And of the same body. And, and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. He said, God put this power in me to preach to Gentiles and for you to understand and know this truth. You know, it's good for you to find out who, who God has made your voice and uh, for what audience. You know, your, your voice will appeal to certain audiences. Right. And, and knowing where, where your voice has an appeal is, is good for you. Mm-hmm. To, to give yourself to wherever that is. You know, it, 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 if it was just to your children, I say just to your children, in comparison to the whole world, right. Right. then there's a great place to use your voice. Yeah. That's reason enough to be to be immersed in gospel truth and understand the word of God to teach and save your household. Yes. We got to be prepared, all right? He said, I want you to understand this, that, that this is a gift given to me to minister unto you. Well, well, look, look why he said he is who he is. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Now, Paul said that God didn't give this gift to the great and astute. And, and he's comparing himself to the other apostles, so the 12, it seems. You can almost read into it. And he didn't give, them, he didn't give it to them. He gave it to me, the least, to reach the whole Gentile world, to put an anointing and a gift in on my life. And if you understood Paul's burden for the, for the Hebrews, Woo. His calling was a burden. Paul, if you'd ask him if he could preach to anybody, he said, line me up some Hebrews. I'll tell him about Jesus. He'd have been unconvincing. Unsuccessful. If he'd have given himself into that ministry, he wouldn't have been effective. But you beat him a few times, throw him on the back of a ship, and drop him off somewhere in, in, in Asia. And cities begin to turn themselves over to Christ. Because the anointing on his life was to the Gentile world, not to the Hebrew world. 
And so, um, watch this. Verse verse eight says, "Unto me who am least, in, uh, who is less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make who, all men. to make all men do what? See. See, this is this chapter is about revelation, and and he's." He, he's talking about this, 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 this revelation that God has poured on him and this burden of this revelation that God has poured on him. And, it, and it's to cause people to see. Do you know how frustrating it is to try to get someone to see the truth? When, 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 and you can tell some people just trying to be stubborn. You know, and you, and you can look at me and you're like, you, you're just playing ignorant. You, you, you know exactly what I'm saying, but you, you're just playing dumb. You know, you're trying to protect yourself. You know, and, and Paul was doing this for the whole Gentile world. Yes, yeah, so we ever told a lie? Well, you know, what are you lying now? You know you told a lie. Stop. <laughs> you know. And, 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 and Paul has this burden for the Hebrews, but he has this calling to the Gentile world to preach his unsearchable riches of, of, of Christ and to make all men see what's the fellowship of the mystery. Where do we come together in this mystery? Where do we all meet together? The place we meet in this mystery is called the church. And to make, and to make all men, you know, some of all kinds, so they're going to be all the rep representation of every ethnicity in heaven. It's not going to be just a Hebrew, you know, coming together um, like they would have their festivals and their feasts. But this is going to be of all people, of all kinds, of all ethnicities. It says um, uh, to see the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world has been hidden where God put this secret inside of him. So he didn't trust with nowhere else. He hid it and nobody could find it. And he hid this mystery of this coming together of the Jew and Gentile world, amen, on the inside of him, who created all things by Jesus Christ. To the intent, watch this, this is why he did it. To the intent that now, until the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church. The manifold wisdom of God. He said the, part, the reason why God did this was so that when, when God will reveal the church into the world, people will be shocked that the church is full of all people of all ethnicities. Mm. Now the devil is trying to sabotage the church. Amen. And he has a ploy to, 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 to discredit the church. And the Bible talks about what happens when men sleep. The enemy comes along and he sows tares among the wheat and let them grow up together side by side. And, and they look just like one another. And you can't tell a tear from the wheat until they start bearing fruit. And when you look at the fruit of what comes from their lives, then you can tell that ain't right. right, right. Amen. And we're living in a day, I'm telling you, that there are so many tares of false gospel that's growing up. And you don't even really know who's who or what's what until the fruit start coming forward. You see the second generation of them, the third generation of them. And, and you see this pattern of, of heresy and hypocrisy and false doctrine, bad theology. And, 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 and they're protecting it because it's their fruit. Meaning that if Someone come out of latter rain and, and they became a heretic and they started preaching false doctrine. It would be the responsibility of, of all the elders, all the ministers, all the deacons to come forward and declare them a heretic. And that their teaching is not representative of what we believe. Amen. Glory to God. And when you have entire movements that has never spoken that way about clear heresy and clear heretics and has never disowned them or rebuked them and they go on teaching heresy. See, but, and, and that stuff looks, it looks good until you start seeing the fruit that come from it. Then you recognize the weaknesses and flaws in it. Because sometimes the original, they can hide the flaws, but the fruit don't know enough. You know how you send a kid to do something and to say something, and, and when they say it, they say it in the worst way? Tell them I ain't here. My mama says she ain't here. 
See, the, the mama knew enough not to say nothing. But the fruit went out and said it all kind of wrong. <laughs> That's how you can tell with them sometimes. And so, um, so this, the purpose was a verse in verse 10 to the intent. Now the, all the principalities and powers of heavenly places, all these spirits, you know, um, heavenly places that may be known the, the, um, by the church, by the manifestation of you and me. Being here, hearing the word of God, standing together, united in Christ. We are revealing the will of God that the devil didn't see coming. He thought we will always be divided. And hating each other. That's why the enemy is doing whatever he can to try to try a race ride in America. We just Christian enough not to fall for it. Amen. Just enough. Amen. We got to stand our ground, otherwise y'all kids may be in trouble. Amen. But 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 you know we have to keep preaching the solidarity that's in Christ. Paul is saying, look, Gentile world, you can save the Hebrews. You can save, amen, the Jews. You, you may be the only hope. And this, uh, that's what I believe is the undercurrent behind this push for unity. Seeing and witnessing firsthand the persecution of the church. I mean, we may be called by God to save Several Christians, you get things all the time about the Christian persecution that's going on right now. And how in, how in Iraq, which used to be the, the uh, uh, central hub of Christianity, now almost every Christian has been murdered or, or ran out and their pop property is taken, amen, by, by the, the state and different Islamics that are there, Islamists. There are regions in, in, in the Middle East and in Africa, which were strongholds, and Asia Minor, which were strongholds for the gospel, that are, that are now almost Christian free. No, after thousands of years of Christianity, every Christian has been run out of certain places of the Middle East. And and this is a continued persecution. This is what he, this type of thing is happening in Paul's day. He was a part of it. And so verse 11 says, according to the eternal purpose, this, this, is, this, this revelation is revealed unto the whole world according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Wherefore, I desire that ye faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. He said, don't trip on what I'm going through. I know I'm going through some stuff, but don't, don't, don't trip. Don't worry about me. You keep on doing what you're doing. You keep preaching the gospel, being steadfast, honoring the word of God. Don't get messed up behind what I'm going through. Don't be discouraged about me. I'm all right. When I die, I know where I'm going. I need you to keep going. See, and he's encouraging them to, to keep pressing forward. He says, now, in the middle of this emotional, uh, what, I, what I believe, um, discourse by, by Paul, uh, he, he shifts, and I believe he breaks down at verse 14 and actually falls to his knees as he says, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Can you feel that? Of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. He's saying that we're all a part of this. And I'm on my knees. Pray. And he's going to pray. This is the actual prayer. That he will grant you. Paul is praying for them. I believe as, as he's writing this, he's praying. That he will grant you according to the riches of his glories to be, to, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, the length, and then the depth and height and to know the love of Christ that past all knowledge, that past knowledge. That you may be filled with all the fullness of God. 
for a Hebrew to make this declaration about a Gentile that they may be filled with all the fullness of God is a powerful prayer of the breaking down of the separation of the ethnicities in Christ Jesus. Amen. That there is no respect of persons with God. That's, that, that's not a, a black church and a white church and a Hispanic church and Asian church. No, we are the people of God. We are the church of God. We are the people of God that are in heaven and in earth. Amen. United in Christ. That's who we are. He says, um, you may be able to comprehend with all the saints whether the breadth and, and the length and the, the length and depth and the height and to know the love of Christ and pass all knowledge that ye may be filled with all the fullness of Christ and he goes into a closing of his prayer. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. <laughs> According to the power that worketh in us. Reading this text in this context, you can see Paul ain't thinking about getting stuff. Paul not talking about, I can believe God for a new house. I can believe God for a new car. I can believe God uh, to get my head to grow back on top. Hey, all things. <laughs> That's not what he's talking about. That's not what Paul. He said the greatest miracle that the barrier between the races can be broken down and eliminated and be meaningless, not just between us, but from God to us. And that the Gentiles can be on the forefront of the move of God and have this great ability and capacity to reach forward and save the Hebrew world. That's exceedingly abundantly above. Yeah. To a Hebrew man, all we can ask or think. But he says, according to the power that worketh in us. Yes, Putting himself in the same place. Access to the same God. Mm -hmm. Access to the same word. Access to the same spirit. Unto him be glory, where? In the church, by Christ Jesus, throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. See, I can see Paul as he's writing this and just, just, just gets overwhelmed and just begins to cry and to write and to cry and to write as he's believing God. I believe his holy imagination is kicking in as he see black, white, red, brown, you know, yellow all coming together, praising God, adoring God, magnifying God, lifting up God. And now when the Hebrews have the assignment to, to, to be the, 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 the moral center of the world and give and given to the world the moralities and ethics of God now the Gentile world can be the saving grace to the Hebrew world and to save those who were born ethnically as a part of Israel Amen. and to touch the lives of those who receive the word first Paul said this is mind boggling this is incredible this is something beyond the imagination that God will flip the script like this. We have a responsibility, people of God, to preach the gospel. We have a responsibility to win our community for Jesus. And if, you're woke, if your community won't hear you, find another community. We must build the church of God worldwide and win souls everywhere. Amen. This is what Paul is saying to the church. That this, this getting closer between the Jews and the Gentiles, this getting closer, coming together for the plan and purpose of God was in the original thought and idea of God. God never intended for there to be a permanent separation 
between ethnicities, but that all people may come together and worship him. See, and, and, and Paul is making this plea. See, you don't understand how, how deep the divide was. But Paul is now making the plea to the other side. There's a power in you. When the message was, there's a power in us because we know God. We're God's people. We're God's chosen. Now Paul is saying to them, there's a power in you. You're God's people. You're God's chosen. Rise up. Preach the gospel. A powerful turnaround. It's taking place to the point where in the middle he just began to break down and just pray while writing this letter. I'm going to read a few verses into the next chapter and then we're going to close. He says, I therefore, that's why I want to transition in there. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beg you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. He said, I want you to see how special this is, how significant this is. This is huge. This is ginormous. God is reaching out to you to save the world. You are bearers of the grace of God. And now you have a responsibility to go into the world and preach Jesus, to bridge that gap between God and man, between man and woman, between truth and absolute truth. To by spiritual and natural application of the word of God. Make a mark on this generation that cannot be erased. He says, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. Put up with each other. I know it's been ugly. But, but just, just humble yourself. Could you, could you do that? Could you just humble yourself? You know, we, we, we get into fights because we're so prideful. You know, it's just our, our pride that, that keep us in, in, in constant fighting and, you know, rebellion. He says, come on, I'm begging you. Stop it. Stop, please. He says, with all, with all lowliness and meekness and long suffering, put up with each other in love. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Woo, this is powerful. He's saying, now, Gentile world, I want you to hold God's body together like the Hebrew world did when they thought they were exclusively the people of God. I need you to hold us together. I need you to forget about what was and just put on Christ. Get with the program. It's time to stop being Gentile and start being in Christ. You are Christian. You're called. You're anointed. You're born again by the same spirit. You're part of the same body. Put on Christ. Let's hold this thing together. It's lifelong relationships. Get closer. Don't let these divides, no matter what they are, rich, poor, black, white, ugly, handsome, Amen. <laughs> he says, in endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace, there is one body. There's one spirit. Even as ye are called and one hope of your calling. Oh, that's so powerful. He said, there's one Lord, one faith. One baptism, one God and the Father of all. It's no difference. You don't have to be Hebrew. You don't have to be of a tribe of, you know, uh, of, of Judah or uh, Benjamin or whatever, to, to be to be significant. God has torn down all of that. That is that is inconsequential. That that has no meaning. That God has torn all of that down, and now He's put you in the body of Christ. And now there's only one body. There are not twelve tribes. One body in this dispensation, where the bodies have been merged to represent Christ instead of the twelve represent Israel. Oh, my God. Huh. 
He says, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. That's a powerful confession to make. The people of God saying it's not just us. Giving up that place of exclusiveness to say, God is using you too. As a matter of fact, you're the hope of the world. Hold this thing together. Latter rain, we have a responsibility to hold this thing together. Paul is charging us. This is a, an epistle to the body of Christ. We're charged to walk in this unity of the spirit. No division among us. Nothing but oneness in the house of God. He says, in, in you all, and, and, and here's what I'm closing. But unto every one of us is given grace <laughs> according to the measure of the gift of Christ. He's saying that we're giving caris. We're giving an ability according to God's ultimate purpose and plan to hold this thing together and to continue building the body of Christ. Amen. As we read through and as we read through chapter three and the beginning of chapter four, I just want to encourage you, Latter Rain, to do your part in the body. To continue to get closer. Don't allow there to be any division among us. Husbands and wives, I'm telling you to love one another. The enemy will love nothing more than to divide, the, divide us. He loves nothing more but to cause there to be a separation and let our pride and our ego stand in the way of us loving one another. And the darker these days gets, the harder it's going to be to even love those of your own household. When Jesus said a man's enemy shall be those of his own household. It's a great darkness. But I'm saying that we are more than able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we can ask or think, according to the power as at work in us. Let's keep our families united in Christ. Let our, our, our common purpose and our common cause be to love Christ. And as we love Christ and get closer to him, we can get closer to one another. As we grab a hold of Christ, we do it by grabbing a hold of one another and praying together and seeking God together and loving one another. I, I, I believe this, this, this is so apropos as we have Yom Kippur and the Day of Atonement. The day of looking back over the year. This is the head of the year. And from the head, you see everything else. And so this below our head is the prior, what happened before. And you can look down over and you can repent. For what you did not do. And you can praise for what he did do. It's kind of different from how we see New Year's. But, you know, this is, this is a time of atonement. And I'm asking for Christ's sake. If there's any division, if there's any hurt, if there's any separation, forgive one another. Forget, let it go. Let it go. It ain't worth it. Amen. I promise you, it ain't worth it. By next week, you probably don't forgot about it. You got to try to remember why you was mad. Right. You know it ain't worth it. When, when you're trying to say, well, what was that? Oh, I know I'm mad for some reason. <laughs> and you're asking yourself, you know, do we get over there? Are we still fighting? Okay. okay. And, and you got you to try to remember if you're still fighting. You know it ain't worth it. That's a mess, ain't it? Yes, it is. Yeah, that's a mess. That's just pride. Yes, amen. I, I, I know I'm, I'm shifting because I feel it, you know? And 
Hearts meet, need to be made right. Especially at home. Especially at home. Especially between husband and wife. Mother and father. Especially. Hmm. If you got to have your way, you're in the way. Ooh. If it's your way or the highway, you're in the way. You're the problem. If you can't negotiate in marriage, you're the problem. God, dog, it, this got to be like this. <laughs> Nothing else will do. If it ain't like this, then you can leave. You the problem. You the problem. I know I'm in a vein, boy. All right. <laughs> but in a marriage, everything that's righteous is up for negotiation. I don't like that. You know, your problem is you have too many expectations going into marriage. That's your problem. You thought your marriage was about you. Y'all keep on playing with me. Because I know I'm circling. And, and the more you think your, your marriage is about you, the more you start making demands and the more you start feeling slighted. And you feel like, how I get this? I'm so good. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. How, do I, how am I the one? Come on, Bishop. With, with my perfect self. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> God, why are you judging me? Why? Why? This heathen. Let me tell you something. I'm going to give you some help. help I'm going to help you out real easy. Kill, murder, eliminate, annihilate all of your expectations. That's how you start over. Until you do that, you're going to be in a rut. You're going to keep on fighting. You only got three fights you're fighting over. Yeah, you can narrow it down to one. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Hey, <laughs> But, I mean, the fights come down to the same few things. Yeah. And you follow that same path. Right, right and it always ends the same thing. We, we were talking about the toilet paper. <laughs> Somebody. <Jesus>. How did we go back four years <laughs> to a conversation we had? Oh, okay. You know what? That's the indication of pride. Yeah, yeah. Pride goes before the fall. The fall. That's the word. That's the word. And, and the more your pride stands in the way, this is the way my marriage is going. This is how my family is going to be. This is how I'm going to, within righteousness. You better erase that jump. Because in marriage, you do not get what you deserve, you get what you negotiate. I know I'm talking right, boy. I've been mad a couple of years now. I'm <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and there's usually one person, okay, I'm going to move, but there's usually one person who is a chief negotiator. There's, there's one person who holding all the cards in their hand. Going, you got a five? Go fish, you know. <laughs> and, and they're they're smoother with their words, their intent, the content of the conversation, the feel and the tone of what's going on. Am, am I talking to anybody? Am I talking? Talk, talk. And, and and look, that mess will ruin your marriage. It will. It will destroy it. 
I don't, I don't care what your cards are. Yes. If it's your dominance. Right. Right. If it's your tears. Right. Right. If it's your past. Come on, Bishop. If it's your present. Yeah. Your future. Mm -hmm. Everybody always do this. I'm tired of everybody always. Everybody always. Shut up. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody always doing you just making stuff up now. You just just stop. No, <clears throat> but we we need to be more forgiving toward each other. Yes, we do. Kinder, loving, yes. gracious, Hallelujah. tender, treating her. I remember when God told me about my wife. That is my daughter. <laughs> like dang, I ain't never thought about it like that. <laughs> How would you feel if someone treated your daughter like that? Hmm. That's different. <laughs> I thought I was right. <laughs> but you have to make sure that you are loving with one another. Amen. You're one body. No man yet hateth his own body. And during this time of Yom Kippur, I do want you to let grace and forgiveness and mercy start at home. If you're going to erase, you can go to your job. You can erase expectations. Say, so, you know what? I'm just going to go tomorrow. I'm just going to, I'm just going to go. I'm just not even going to think about it. And just go, go and start all over the next day at work. Yeah. Save your best behavior for home. That's right, Bishop. You know, you know, how, you know how you treat your spouse? Here's how you treat your spouse. You know how you want to change? Okay, oh, this, this is my last nugget. Or oh, next to last one of them. Amen. <laughs> Treat them, you know, old school phones where you had to pick them up and you didn't know who's on the other end? Right, right. You, you, you had no caller ID? Right. And every time you answer the phone, you could be in the middle of the most heated battle. <laughs> Boy, y'all could be throwing stuff, stabbing each other, drop kicking, <laughs> running each other over with lawnmowers, everything. But you, that phone, hello? <laughs> yeah, uh huh. No, what? Hey, let me, let me give you a call back. You turned into Mr. Nice, boy. You was, you was Miss Nice. You was just. See, treat, treat your spouse like the other person yeah. on the other end of the phone. Amen, Bishop. Amen. Before you knew it was them. Because yeah. once you found out it's them, you're like, what? <laughs> Where would all that go? You know, and love one another. I, I want to encourage. I want to encourage love during this time period and forgiveness amongst the the spouses, the body, yes. Amen. Because we need each other. We we can't do it without one another. Yes. It's our only means to make a mark on this generation that cannot be erased. Amen. amen. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord with a clap offering. Amen. Yes.